Over the past 20 years, the U.S. has borrowed more and more money. As a comparison to the share of GDP, it's around 100 percent, the highest since World War II. The biggest recent hike happened in 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic hit the U.S. and crippled the nation's economy. Congress finally cleared a $900 billion coronavirus relief package just before midnight last night, and with it, a $1.4 trillion bill that funds the government through the fiscal year. The question of whether it's economically feasible to keep adding to this mountain of debt has long vexed Congress, which is in charge of the debt ceiling, the law that decides how much the U.S. is allowed to borrow. We Democrats supported uh, uh, lifting the debt ceiling because it's the responsible thing to do. I implore them one more time not to play Russian roulette with the American economy. As lawmakers prepare to likely raise the ceiling again in early December, here's a look at how the U.S.'s debt works and why economists say the U.S. can keep on borrowing, at least to a point. Provided, of course, Congress raises the debt limit. There are some limitations, though, on how much they can ultimately borrow, and those have to do with inflation and interest rates. Here's what happens when the government needs to borrow more money to pay for its economic agenda. First, Congress passes laws to determine spending and taxes. If the government spends so much that spending exceeds taxes, the Treasury must finance the deficit by borrowing, issuing Treasury bonds and bills. When Treasury issues a, a Treasury bond or a Treasury bill, this is basically an IOU. An investor gives the Treasury some money, an expectation that they'll get the money back with interest. Greg Ipp, who has covered the U.S. economy for The Wall Street Journal for nearly two decades, says that people view treasury bonds as a safe option for saving. So when the treasury sells bonds to investors, two things happen. First, the government gets money to pay its bills. And second, it agrees to pay investors interest. So when the government issues debt, they will use that money to meet all the obligations the federal government has. They may use it to send Social Security benefits checks to recipients. They may use it to pay the salaries of the military or the civilians in the federal civil service. And they may use it to pay the interest on the debt they've borrowed in the past. If interest rates are zero, then in theory, the government could borrow an infinite amount because it will never have to pay any interest on it. Conversely, if interest rates are extremely high, that really limits how much the government can borrow because the interest bill would be so large. Today, interest rates are at historic lows, which economists say means the government can keep borrowing. But the Treasury is competing for savers' money with other borrowers, like households, companies, and other governments. If those other people decide to borrow more, the Treasury would have to offer a higher interest rate to attract those savings. So if interest rates go up a lot, that's going to significantly increase the bill that the government pays for interest on its debt, in which case one of three things has to happen. Either it has to raise taxes to pay that added interest, it has to cut other types of spending, which nobody likes, or it has to borrow even more. And then you get this, this cycle where high interest forces you to borrow more, which raises the debt, which forces the interest rates even higher, and then you have to borrow even more. And that's a very dangerous cycle to get into. But there's another limitation, too. If Congress puts too much of the borrowed money back into the economy through things like stimulus checks, that can cause inflation. If it borrows that money and then goes and spends it, and that spending exceeds the economy's ability to produce the goods and services needed to satisfy that spending, the result is too much spending chasing too few goods, and you get inflation. And when inflation goes up, interest rates go up, and you're back into that problem of the high interest uh, bill making the debt unsupportable. Inflation was 5.3 percent in the 12 months through August, close to the highest in 12 years. But Ip says this is largely a different type of inflation. This seems to reflect mostly temporary uh, factors. We're coming out of this pandemic, so there's suddenly this surge in demand and a lot of restraints on the supply of a lot of products. Hopefully these uh, transitory shortages will go away in a year or two and inflation will fall back. The kind of inflation you worry about is when you have persistent levels of spending that constantly exceed the economy's fundamental capacity to supply stuff. That's the kind of inflation that lasts for a long time. So, back to Congress's role. The debt ceiling needs to be addressed. The only question is, who should address it? And I hope our friends on the other side will step up and take care of it. Since 2011, each of the seven times that the debt limit was addressed, Congress did so on a bipartisan basis. Congress decides on the debt limit. When the Treasury has reached it, it can't issue more until Congress votes to raise the debt limit. That's even if Congress already passed a budget that requires borrowing. 
This has led some to wonder, why can't we just print off the money to pay the mountain of debt? If the Fed prints too much money this way, you're back into that problem of the Treasury spending that money and causing inflation and causing interest rates to go up. With the option of printing money off the table, it will ultimately come down to Congress to raise the debt limit in December to avoid a default on the debt. 